Thank you. Let me stop share and it's all. All right, right. you're going to stop share and I'm going to start a share. Let's see if I can get the right thing. If I can, can you enable that for me, whoever the host is? Oh, let me make you co host one that second. Would be awesome. So while we um, do all this stuff, uh, there will be, I'll, I'll be inviting you to um, do some reflection with writing uh, this evening. So if, while we get this sort of spun up, if you want to grab something to write with and something to write on, that might be helpful for you. Um, but it's totally, you can participate however you would like because we're in those days where sometimes just showing up is what we got in the tank. So, um, all right, hopefully you're seeing a slide thing. Everyone seeing a slide? Yeah, cool. All right, sweet. Um, so yes, this talk is called Eliciting the Positive Emotional Attractor. Uh, I always like to have a pretty nature-based photo on my on my slides. This is taken just up the road from my house. I live in Maine, so it's a little bit different um, outside here than for many of you in the Bay Area. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, I don't like to spend a whole lot of time because you didn't come to hear about me here, here I think, to hear about what I have to say. Um, I got some letters after my name, the one, the um, MSPOD, that's Masters of Science in Positive Organizational Development, as we mentioned, is uh, granted by the Case Western Reserve, the Weatherhead School of Management there. Uh, I did, Richard Boyatzis was, was the second reason I, I, I went to that particular program. Um, appreciative Inquiry was invented at that uh, department as well. So I wanted to learn more about that approach from Cooper Ryder and Ron Fry, who created that, and then um, I was interested in emotional intelligence, and so I was following some of Richard's stuff, and it's like, man, you know, is, is I got good advice that when you do graduate studies, find the people you want to learn from and go there. So that's what I did. Um, it was a good choice. It's really, really cool stuff. Uh, so these days, I simply say I bring people together to solve complex problems. That's a little bit of a baited hook, because if you know much about complexity, you know that those problems don't stay solved very long. Um, and they just kind of evolve as you as you work with them, but it is a it's a, it's a succinct way to kind of articulate what I do. Um, so I work at a bunch of different scales. I've uh, in different modalities. I've been doing the software stuff for a, a while now. I've been doing this agile stuff uh, for a while as well. Um, as we said, mentioned, I, I'm a trainer. Teach uh, with Adventures of Agile. I've been on some podcasts and I live in Maine and uh, I've got a family here and uh, ride my bike. That's me riding off a, a, I don't know, a six foot or so drop at a bike park in New Hampshire last summer, two summers ago. Um, so that's what I do for fun. Um, it's, it's awesome. So what are we hoping to hit tonight? Um, I'm hoping to give you an understanding of the basics of this idea of a positive emotional attractor and what is it? how you might use it, um, how might it fit with increasing agility, specifically with leadership, and uh, some concrete ways, some pathways that you can uh, use to um, work with that, eliciting that PEA response. There's some considerations, like ethical things you might wanna think about as you um, play with this idea, and, uh, it will be somewhat experiential. So, but again, that's invitational. If you would like to do that, great. If you just want to listen, that's fine as well. It's totally up to you. Um, there should be some time at the end for questions. So, um, but also please feel free to just jump in and uh, interrupt um, if if you have questions. And I'm assuming somebody can keep an eye on the chat. And if something pops there, just interrupt me, and uh, I'm happy to to kind of go where the conversation goes. All right. So why does this thing, this idea of a PEA, a positive emotional attractor, why does it matter? Why might you care? Um, well, we're social critters, us human beings. And um, in complex uh, work, especially the answers that we need, uh, at least in my experience, emerge. And they emerge from the spaces between people rather than one or two experts. And the relational fabric between people like on a team supports that emergence. And so the more that teams can actively foster those relationships and organizations can foster those relationships, 
there is a growing body of evidence that that's uh, helpful in achieving what they need to achieve. Uh, again, this idea of, of solving things in complexity that where there is no clear answer, um, you have to allow that answer to emerge. That uncertainty can be very uncomfortable for people. The ambiguity can be stressful. And so having strategies to buffer against the stresses of that is actually really critically important. Um, COVID hasn't helped those stresses. Uh, it's funny, I need to give this talk as I think maybe more than we wanted to hear it because um, I've been having a hard time. It's really wearing on me two years in and not leaving my house and all of the things. And I'm one of the lucky ones, right? I'm still able to make a living. My family's still healthy. And, and if it's this hard for me, I, I can't even imagine uh, what some other folks are up against. Um, <clears throat> there's uh, definitely positive psychology is an interesting um, thing. I think it's kind of like agile. <laughs> There's some really good nuggets in there, but man, there's a lot of snake oil floating around and a lot of uh, misunderstanding and a lot of poor understanding. Um, so this idea of, you know, that you can't just exist in the positive emotional attractor, you need um, what happens with the negative emotional attractor as well, because it's, it's not all bad. Um, it's actually really powerful, um, but you can't exist in, in either or it needs to be a, a movement between the two. If we're interested in sustaining change, um, just change is not sustained. Um, oh, here, here we go. How many of you, it's January 18th. How many of you made a New Year's resolution this year? Anybody? Or have we, and everyone's like, no. We, why we, not? Why you not? Know, uh, <laughs> you know, raise your hand or put it in the chat if you did. I'm just you curious, know. right? And and if you're still able to, to stick to it, right? Um, and they don't work, like we know they don't work. Um, and why we'll, we'll learn a little bit more about why they don't work. It's a little bit of a tangent, um, but if we're if we're serious about sustained change, we need to anchor it in something generative and uh, positive rather than uh, negative and deficient deficit based. Right? It needs to be a strengths based change. Some thoughts about effective leadership. Um, the TLDR there. It's about the people, <laughs> not task uh, expertise. There are physical reasons to do this for yourself, for others, um, that have to do with your immune system and your uh, just your your cardiovascular health and your mental health and renewal and and your ability to stay effective as uh, as the world piles on you and more. So those are hopefully there's something interesting for you about why you might want to uh, to dig into this a little bit. Uh, it is an interesting idea. Um, it, it, it draws from complexity. Um, complexity itself is a kind of a multidisciplinary, multi-pronged um, idea or set of ideas. And so, you know, originally it came out of um, you know chaos theory and mathematics, and it you know fluids uh, studying you know nonlinear fluid systems in, in physics. Um, there's uh, stuff about biology and physiology. There's psychology. Um, so any of these disciplines are massive and they have really smart people who know a huge amount in them. Uh, and so when we find something, when I find something like uh, the PEA, which sort of borrows bits and pieces from stuff, I think that's really exciting. And I think we should always be wary um, because we can get stuff wrong. And there is, uh, you know, there's some references in the literature, like around the, the Losada and Hefe paper, if you've heard of that. Um, where they use the Lorenz attractor to generate this uh, this positivity ratio of 3.75 to one of positive to negative interactions that you have to get to hit a tipping point. And it's like, that's insane. You can't do that with complex systems like human beings. You, you can do that with fluid systems like water because water doesn't change, but people do. So gotta be careful with, with how we do this stuff, how we apply it. So that's a little bit of an intro. Uh, this is the the point where I would invite you, because it's sometimes easier to show people and have them experience this. So think back to a leader, and this leader you would never work with again, ever. You couldn't get paid enough to work with this person again. You wouldn't even take their call. They're on your blacklist. What do they do? 
and how did they make you feel and what was accomplished um, through that? So I just give you, invite you to spend, you know, 30 seconds or so. Um, you can just think about this and, and experience it, or you can write it down. Um, but yeah, just take a moment to think about that experience. I think I've forgotten it already. I've blacked it out. You know? All right. Anyway. Well, bring it back. <laughs> Don't worry. You can put it back away oh, when we're done. <laughs> I remember. I remember for sure. Drawing a blank. Lucky man. I love lucky man. Yeah, and Logan started a. That's a great, great. Yeah, throw throw some ideas into that uh, into that chat, or just you know yeah. speak them out loud. Sort of like, what about this for you? What was your experience of that? I felt small, bullied. People make me feel really bad, humiliated. Find your shame button and push on that thing a few times. Especially in front of other people, that's always a good tactic to improve performance. Uh, yeah, blaming for stuff you have no control over. Uh huh. Yeah. So when we say leader, this is usually not the kind of leader we aspire to be. Yeah. This is this is and 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 um. How do you feel? What's your experience of 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 this memory? Like, do you feel yourself reliving it at all? Yeah. Like, do you feel anything happening in your body, like somatically? Yeah. 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 So what we're doing right now with this activity is um, eliciting the uh, the negative emotional negative. attractor. Yeah. Um, I did this. I do it in this order. I used to do it. Richard does it the other way around. And I gave a talk about leadership at um, one of the prisons here in Maine to the warden and his chief uh, his staff members. And they were amazing. It was like one of the most compassionate group of people I've ever worked with. It was incredible. I had no idea what to expect. Um, and one of the guys, you know, this big tough guy in uniform, you know, with the badge and everything, he goes at, at the end of the activity, he goes, man, why'd you do that? Now you left us all bummed out. <laughs> like, sorry, no, no good feedback. I'll flip it. Um, yeah. When saying, I'm actually feeling grateful. I no longer have to report to that person. <laughs> That's awesome way to flip it. So yeah, let, let's flip it. Let's, um, let's think back to another leader. This one would be, oh man, if this person called you, you'd always take the call. If they called you and they said, I got a thing, you would be like, yes, I don't even care what it is. I want to work with you, right? They're on your short list. What did they do? How do they make you feel? What was what was accomplished and just kind of go to that memory and spend some time with it. Yeah, when you're ready, throw stuff into the chat or say it out loud. Hmm. And consider again, what is happening in you as you relive this memory, what's your experience? What's your somatic saying? What's different? And if you want to come off mute, I'd love to hear some other voices too. What's different for you between those two? Not so much the content, but you're just your experience of reliving that memory or those two memories. Yeah, felt sense. How do they make you feel? Kind of thing. Yeah, scene versus transactional. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. The the first one tends to make people feel maybe anxious, afraid, ashamed, um, frustrated, yeah, unseen, and the second one tends to calm people down. 
uh, make them feel appreciated, make them feel seen, make them feel acknowledged, make them feel worthy, right? And, and that journey that we just did is flipping a discontinuous shift from negative to positive emotional attractor, okay? And so you can do that as a coach, you can do that as a leader. You have to be really intentional about the language you use to do it though. And so we'll talk a little bit about some of that as well. Okay. All right, let's move on. I wanna kind of keep us moving. I'm hoping there'll be some conversation about some of this, some of these ideas. Um, otherwise it'll be a pretty short presentation. We'll get to uh, networking real quick and maybe we'll just start cracking beers. And that's, that's awesome too. <laughs> So what is this thing? I'm talking about this, this PEA, this positive emotional tracker. What the heck is this guy talking about? All right, so here's how it is defined. Richard, again, this is Richard's work. I've no, like nothing to do with this stuff. Uh, this is what he says about it. So it's an attractor with three dimensions. Um, there's an emotional uh, dimension to it. And, uh, and the, the positive emotional attractor, that includes emotions like, or emotional experiences like gratitude, hope, joy, compassion, and love. Um, you could also put any of these uh, amazing lists that you, you threw into the, uh, the chat as well. So there's an emotional component of it, that's one dimension. There's an endocrine uh, uh, component to it as well, that when we um, are experiencing the PEA, uh, there's some endocrine, some nervous system stuff happening that's stimulating our endocrine system and releasing um, hormones like oxytocin and vasopressin. Okay, those are like nice, fun, uh, feel good, love hormones, right? So those things are they're, they're happening at, at our uh, at our endocrine system uh, through engagement of the parasympathetic nervous system that does things like, you know, make you feel like you want to approach people because they're friends rather than run away from them or avoid them because they're enemies. Um, all kinds of good stuff. Uh, your breathing tends to slow, your heart rate tends to slow, you, you calm down. Uh, you're able to grow, literally grow neuro, neurons. Your, your neuroplasticity uh, kind of engages and you're able to learn actively and create new learning pathways in your uh, brain and probably in other parts of your body, like your, um, what's it called? The enteric nervous system. Is that what it's called in your gut? It's like this whole autonomous nervous system happening in your gut with a big old hard line up the vagus nerve up to your brain. No one has really has any idea what it does, but it's probably pretty important. Um, so yeah, so neurogenesis becomes possible, uh, which is probably really important if you're trying to help people learn new behaviors and new ways of being and new ways of thinking. Probably very critical. Yeah. Uh, and your immune system actually works better. So you get healthier when you're in this space. So that those are the, the dimensions of the attractor. Um, the language of the attractor, I don't know, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. Um, it's a, a, a strange attractor is a really specific thing in mathematics. And I don't know if it's the same kind of thing here or not, uh, but it's at worst a metaphor. So. Um, it can be helpful. Uh, so you're in neurological, we already talked about that a little bit. Okay, so the NEA is also has the same three dimensions. Um, those uh, things are slightly different or very different. Negative emotions, things like fear, anxiety, uh, unhealthy or unproductive anger, um, hate. Uh, the things that, you know, riots and mobs and demagogues whip up, you know, bringing people together under those banners. So those are negative emotions. Um, the sympathetic nervous system, which uh, prepares your body to run or fight. So it, it takes blood flow away from your brain and, and then moves it into your um, large muscle groups, preparing you for physical activity. Um, it overstates existing neurons, which can... Uh, actually, um, says the literature, be counterproductive to their ongoing uh, function or high function. Okay, so these things have kind of mirrors uh, of each other. However, it's not an or sort of a thing. We need them both, right? If you if 
all we do is, is uh, hang out in the PEA, we don't get a whole lot done. If all we do is hang out in the NEA, we have a lot of problems there as well. So we need to be able to move fluidly uh, between them uh, because NEA is often where a lot of the, the actual action and follow through and sustainment um, really kind of picks up. Uh, you may have heard, so there's there's a few sort of different ideas that all kind of hook onto each other. So there are two neural networks. I just want to hit on them really briefly called the default mode network and the task positive network. The default mode network is a set of brain, interconnected brain structures that uh, do things like if, if you put people in functional MRIs and, and have them think about, um, uh, you know, these positive emotions and uh, creative problem solving and and uh, kind of relationships and gratitude and compassion, the default mode lights up. It, it allows us to navigate social complexity and perceive it versus when we ask people to solve problems and, and do logical analysis that lights up another uh, network. And these are mutually um, exclusive. They When one lights up, the other one kind of gets suppressed blood flow wise and, and vice versa. So task positive is things like solving programming problems or um, you know, analyzing flow metrics or any tactical kind of situation where we're looking to solve something. And we gotta be careful here as leaders because if you ask somebody, what's your goal? They're likely to interpret that as a problem to be solved kind of a question. And that is going to elicit a task positive response. As we elicit task positive responses, we also tend to elicit language around what we need to, ought to, should, must. And, and people often don't actually want that. And when you ask somebody a different question of what would it be if it were right, suddenly they are, act, you're more likely to elicit a, a default mode uh, response and you'll get creativity and, and passion and dreaming and whatnot. Yeah, now I wonder what would light up when people are pair programming. Um, I think it depends how they're pairing. It depends, I think, on the quality of the relationship and the quality of the interaction. And, and are they listening to each other and respecting each other and hearing each other? Or are they just, you know, like uh, Kathy will maybe, so Kathy and I work together. Um, there's been this big sort of kerfuffle in the development group because um, they've interpreted pairing as one person watches another person work. I'm like, that is just horrible. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> I don't know why, how that, that idea came to your heads, but like, just stop, like whatever it is, just, just stop. Um, uh, how much of our past trauma is stored in the default mode network? I'm not sure how these, uh, if, if memory is a part of those or not, I don't think it is. Though when we, um, you know, that past trauma that gets triggered with like threat detection where we, we see something and then we map it into another experience, like a kind of a gestalt match or something like that, or, or a, a amygdala hijack. I'm, um, I'm thinking sort of a little bit about how in the polyvagal theory, when we are in the parasympathetic and say go into meditation, yep, we drop into the default mode yep. and then we activate both the sort of the joyous part of uh, the, um, the vagus system as well mm -hmm. as the dorsal part where all that trauma is stored. And so somehow they're connected, but I don't know the neuroscience well enough about how that connects with the default network. Yeah, and I, that I'd lump myself there too. Like I'm no, I'm no cognitive scientist um, and any of these things get crazy deep. I do think um, it's interesting that, that some of those patterns of, of trauma can be re kind of sort of re the, the regrow. I don't like to use reprogram because it makes it sound like computers. So I'm looking for a different word. Uh, we can relearn it, right? And so this example of, I had this horrible experience, but now I have gratitude around it because I'm not in it anymore. Right, and so we've repatterned our experience of that hard thing, right? Um, so there's all, I mean, there's just so much going on that we have no idea. <laughs> and it's just um, so complex. Yeah, 
Jump in, please. One thing to note about trauma, um, there's different ty- different ways of managing it. Sometimes you want to reprogram it, and sometimes it's kind of like a building side-by-side way to function with it. It depends on the severity of it, and it depends on where it triggers from. Can you recreate it? Can you not? Depends on the treatment and so forth. So mm-hmm. just adding this. I love it. I mean, again, it's it's a perfect example of like, oh, here's this one word, trauma. And it's like, oh my gosh, it's just a huge universe of people who know so much about it. And there's so much nuance and so much to consider. Um, you know, I think that happens with a lot of these this work. Um, anyway, I don't, can you see the little animation that's spinning? Cool. So this is a, a plot of a Lorenz attractor. Uh, this was originally, I believe, out of fluid dynamics. So I'm again, I'm kind of like, could you plot the PEA and the NEA in the same way? I don't know. Um, Boyatza says that it is a Lorenz attractor. I don't know. You can make up your own mind about it. Uh, but I do like the plot because it kind of shows this sort of fluidity of, of moving between the two. What you know is that really effective leaders are able to, to flip-flop very, very quickly in quick succession um, with high degrees of awareness. And they also uh, understand through social awareness and relationship management, which are two kind of competencies out of the original emotional intelligence um, model, how to guide others and sort of how to shape that um, in a room with those that they're leading. Um, because again, we can't, we can't just stay in one or the other. We need them both. Kind of, they, they charge each other up. Yeah. Um, any other questions or comments so far from folks? Look at the time real quick. I'm okay. just, I was just thinking when you made the comment about charging each other up, I always think of it like dancing. You know, it's like dancing or music. You know, you're, you're sort of play in the room if you're... Um, and I mean, and not just like in a meeting, but in, in any interaction, it, it's just mm-hmm. so connected to how the energy is flowing around and you can't, you can't ignore when the negative things come up. And so you're, you have to transform them or, you know, not let them suck up the entire space. So I, I like that graphic as well. Yeah. I'm just going to apologize and nerd out for a moment. I, I just did a <laughs> workshop with Peter Levine on trauma this weekend and you know, Peter talks about um, the two vortices of trauma. There's, you know, when somebody is in a traumatic loop, they're li- living out of one side of the vortice and to kind of get out of one way of getting out of it is to have a counter vortice to balance you out. So it's really interesting to to see, you know, as a visual of like that interchange of both sides, you mm-hmm. know, especially in a, in a circular pattern too. It's kind of interesting. This must be the um, it must be the thing we're all examining lately because I'm in the middle of a course myself on collective trauma and collective healing and mm-hmm. and uh, yeah certainly timely information yeah yeah so uh, a little side note um, there's a an incredible little book called the Eudaimonic Pie um, I God I just had the reference up but then I I lost it I I've read it years and years and years ago an undergraduate um, down in Santa Cruz. And Santa Cruz, UC Santa Cruz, actually where uh, chaos theory was discovered. Uh, and it was discovered quite by accident. And Eudaimonic Pi is um, the story of some physicists and mathematicians who were trying to figure out how do we build wearable computers that will beat the odds of roulette tables. Um, and as well, as they were trying to figure this out and building these wearable computers and, and whatnot, they were also, that was what they did at night. And then during the day, they were up in the applied science building with these new computers um, with like these, you know, cathode scopes plugging in equations that everyone assumed would eventually resolve. But without uh, machine-based com- computers, they, we, we could never like run them long enough by hand to see. And so they're sitting there just watching these, these attractors just go for days and days and days. And like, what is going on here? This is totally different. This isn't a little different. This is something very strange is happening here. So the book's called Eudaimonic Pie. It's, it's pretty cool. All right. Um, so 
Uh, yeah. All right. So we'll just we'll just keep moving on here. So eliciting the PEA or a PEA response. So what about this? Here's some some just actionable things. And again, I'll invite you to um, do some reflection here. Um, one way to help people get into that positive emotional attractor space is to reconnect them with the best of their life or something that's in their life. So there's a couple of ways we can do. We can either go Historically, we can look in the past uh, and we can ask uh, appreciative based questions like imagine a, a high point um, where something amazing was happening in your life and it could have been in a church or a school or any context. And, um, you know, what was happening and what were you able to do and what were we call some root causes of success there. Uh, so that that can happen, that can help, or we can say a possible future. Um, and there's a couple of, uh, of ways of getting the possible future. Um, so I'm, I'll, I'll do a couple of these, and then you can choose one that you would like rather than going through all of them. So one way to get at the possible future is we call it the $50 million question, which is literally to ask if you had 50 million, you'd look at your bank account and what just happened, there's 50 million bucks in there. You get to keep it all. What's different? and let people sit in there. Um, you can ask people who has been influential in your life, who has contributed to you becoming who you are in a meaningful, powerful way. Like who is that person and what happened? Um, we can hook into people's social identity groups. Um, this is a really, we'll, we'll come back to this. This is a really powerful tool for uh, leadership. Um, you can get at values and beliefs. And we have to, this is again, this, we can, we can, uh, if you just ask somebody, Hey, what's your, what are your values? What's your belief system? Uh, that's a task positive question versus saying something like, how should this thing be? Or how should the world be? Or what, what might it be if it were right? Um, which are kind of more clean questions. All right. So, um, I invite you to go ahead and, and grab one of those that's somewhat interesting to you and just grind on it for maybe 20 or 30 seconds and just kind of consider it. give that a little pause and as you consider the content of what you've come up with also consider again the, the experience of that inquiry for you and again I'm just kind of curious does anybody have um, something uh, on that latter question, what's the experience of that inquiry that you would like to share? You can either throw it in the chat or just go off mute and, and say it. It's, it's surprising. I, I was looking at who was influential in my life. And the easiest people that popped up um, were before the age of 20. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, I mean, there are some, it becomes, it becomes harder. <laughs> Yeah. What else? And what was your experience as you considered that idea? I mean, certainly gratitude. Sort of the yeah. breathing. I could definitely feel my my breathing change. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. What else? Feel free to use the chat as well, folks, to share like yep. what's what's coming up for you. 
or come right off mute. So I'm not thinking back too far into the past, but one of the things that sometimes happens is I may get on a call with somebody and we have a conversation about, I don't know, random things, but at the end of it, especially if it happens early in the morning, it changes my entire day. Like it mm. changes how I approach my work. I feel like lighter. Mm. I feel more right in my head and I feel more ready to <laughs> deal with whatever might come up at work. Yeah, that buffer, yeah, kind of sets you up. So it's really interesting to me that Olaf just said that because I found myself really sort of confused and overwhelmed by the answer to this. I was like, it's really struggling with what to, what to, mm -hmm. what to think of. And um, I love his answer because um, he has been a person for me who actually helps me find that very sort of focus that, that he's describing. And so, um, so I just think that that's really interesting because <laughs> I feel like I just sort of lived at kind of a moment of what you're describing, what you're trying to bring out here. Yeah. Um, my cat is on cue. This is Ferrari. Um, so other, and these are very conversational right, with you and somebody else, but if, if you are um, on your, uh, by yourself, for example, and you're looking for some avenues to renewal through a, a PEA response, um, many people really enjoy petting animals like dogs and cats. Um, that can be incredibly profound uh, experience for them. Um, spending time outside uh, in the natural environment, the, the, critically the sounds of the natural environment. Uh, you know, one of the reasons why I, I wanted to live where I live is I go outside and it's quiet. That's on, I'm on 20 acres in rural Maine on a dirt road. Um, if I hear traffic, it's a big deal. Like, I love that, you know, it's, it's easy to, to just feel really renewed for me outside. Um, creating things, creative acts, whether, you know, it's whatever that is for you. It could be cooking, it could be uh, creating art, it could be playing music. Um, uh, meditative practices of, uh, of gratitude and, and mindfulness, um, praying to a loving God, praying to vengeful gods, turns out doesn't work as well. Um, that tends to elicit uh, NEA um, responses, but if you pray to a loving God, that can um, really be a, a, a elicit a PEA response internally. Um, so there's a lot of things that we can do um, for ourselves that will elicit these and, and kind of give us those, those kinds of buffers um, that Olaf was talking about uh, as well. Um, so one of the things that I've I've done here's a, here's a trick. Uh, that I've I have not been able to pull it off in Zoom land since COVID, um, but before COVID, when I spent a lot of time traveling around and, and doing training in corporate environments like agile trainings, um, I would start every training with this icebreaker, but I didn't call it an icebreaker. Um, <clears throat> and the icebreaker goes something like this: uh, Imagine, and, and and this might make sense to you. Sorry, now there's a cat here flying around. Uh, why I might have structured it this way. So imagine uh, when you walked into this room, rather than coming to a fundamentals of agile or product ownership or whatever it is, um, I handed you a, a briefcase of $50 million cash. You get to keep it all. And I give you a plane ticket to anywhere on the planet. And that can you can take that however you would like. And, and now imagine that this room, instead of being just a, a conference room, it's a representation of the world, this map of the world. And I kind of give a north and a south and an east and a west. And I invite people to go stand in that place that they would fly to with their, with their money. And then I invite them to share, be like, okay, who are you? What's your name? What's your role? Where are you standing and why? And what's something you would like to get out of this time together? And so what that ended up doing was it got everybody talking. They would bump into each other. Everyone's geography sucks. So this room is having a great time just trying to figure out where the, where the hell is this place in the world. Um, and, and you got some crazy like, well, I'm in Australia. I thought I was in Australia, <laughs> like over there. Right? Um, so, so people are laughing and they're having a good time. Um, they're, they're, you know, possibility focused. They're, they're totally in PEA default mode, right? And that's how we start the training. 
And it's so much better than like, oh, we're going to go around the room and just tell me what your name is and what your role is and what do you want to get out of today, right? It's like night and day. So that's it's just a, a real simple way that you can take some of these ideas and sort of combine them um, in leadership roles to uh, to create that kind of emotional resonance with people. And you can do that at, at the beginning of a uh, like a retrospective or a scrum team thing or a whatever portfolio review. <laughs> Bring people together, get them into. Uh, PEA together without telling them that's what you're doing. Just ask them a powerful question, have them share the answers to each other, and then start your real conversation. And I think it'll probably be different. Yeah. Um, clean language is another really awesome set of questions that can can help here. Um, if you're a trainer, uh, doing things like flipping the classroom or training from the back of the room can be really powerful to to help. Um, yeah. So hopefully there's some some cool stuff in there. Uh, any any other thoughts, questions, comments? Remind me again of some of those questions from Clean Language. We have it. Uh, oh, I, I know this was with yeah. Um, I I just use like the the five core questions. What would you like to have happen? Um, well, how should it be? <laughs> if people are complaining. Well, how should it be? Um, if uh, that thing were a thing, what kind of a thing would it be, right? So if the PEA were a thing, what kind of thing would it be? Um, if that thing had a location, where might it be? And then the questions of sequence, what happens right after? So if you got that thing, that would be next. And what happens right before? And just using those questions and then the, peop the language that people give you back, you can just kind of roll with a conversation that's um, all about putting them in the center of it, right? And putting their language in the center of it, putting their metaphor in the center of it, and helping them understand more what what their model of uh, that thing is. And we don't have to do anything except just ask them questions and mirror back what they say. It's really like if you see, I got to see Caitlin Walker do this stuff. It was like mind blowing. Like wow, she's good. It's like yeah, she practiced a lot. <laughs> Didn't just happen. Um, Cool. Any other questions? Awesome. Yep. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say now you've got me thinking about something, but I'm but I'm not going to talk about it yet. <laughs> okay. Cool. So let's talk about some ethical considerations, um, because with great power comes great responsibility, uh, and there's this idea of approach and avoidance. You know, threat detection, social threat. Um, so when as evolutionary biology seems to like this idea of what's called exaptation, right? Where you, it, it takes something that does one thing and then it just uses it for something else rather than building whole new systems. So um, as you, and, and my undergraduate degree is in anthropology and I always got kind of bristly on the back of my neck when people would say, well, early human beings obviously were doing this thing and thus that's why X, Y, or Z happened or that's why X, Y, or Z is, is happening today. That's why we are the way, way we are. I don't know. We don't know. We weren't there. Like, <laughs> we, we don't know what happened. Um, <clears throat> but I think it is reasonably to say that human beings have uh, been pretty successful as a species. A lot of us have survived. A lot of us have reproduced. And um, it's hard to do that if you're not detecting threat pretty accurately in the physical environment. You know? And so the threat detection system that we have in the physical environment uh, it's also the same threat detection systems that get uh, activated in social threat situations. And, and, and uh, David Rock's scarf model talks about that a little bit, um, if that's a, a thing um, that you're familiar with. Um, so this idea of, um, I think there's some ethics here that we have to be really clear on of, of why are we eliciting PEA? Um, because it's going to help people want to approach us, and um, and it's want it's going to make people you know as those uh, hormones oxytocin and vasopressin are released, those are like bonding hormones, and so we have to be I think uh, very careful about um, why are we doing this and what's our true intent, because it can set us up to manipulate people or or turn into um, 
situations that we didn't intend if they're not authentic. And I, I, ju I just can't hit on this hard enough, especially if there's power involved. Um, it's interesting. Uh, I, I was reviewing all of my notes for my graduate lectures uh, as preparation for this talk. And one of the things that Richard said um, is that there's a growing amount of evidence that every ethics breach was uh, a task positive moment rather than a default mode moment. So, you know, people can do things that they might not want to do. <laughs> um, you can convince them, you can coerce them. You know, leadership can be a negative thing. We can do dissonant stuff um, and you can trick people and you can socially engineer them into uh, situations what, that they otherwise would not choose. So um, this stuff, and, and you can use all of this stuff, you, know, you can twist it, it can be, it can be damaging. So um, yeah, just be really, really clear. Um, why are you doing what you're doing um, and how are you approaching that? that uh, conversation. Um, if you want to learn more, and I'm happy to provide these slides. Um, this is some of the, the source materials that I pulled all of this from. Um, again, you'll notice that uh, Richard's name is on all of it. It's the, the, the whole concept is his. Um, <laughs> at least he's the one that, that sort of kind of created the, the name, uh, as far as I can tell. And uh, yeah. He's, he's a pretty amazing thinker. If you're not familiar with this stuff, um, he holds three different chairs at Case Western Reserve, uh, or three different professorships, I should say, and three different departments. So he's, he's fairly well, <laughs> well-rounded, rigorous uh, researcher, which I really respect. And that's what I got. Um, so um, any questions? It's 53 minutes. Um, so I wanted to kind of keep that brief if possible, if there's anything that I, anything we want to go deeper into, I want to leave some time for that. So you want to unshare? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Questions from anyone? 